Okay, we are, we are going to start. Um, uh, people will join us in, I guess, as in the next few minutes. And so my name is Oscar Avila. I am the current president of the Cybersecurity SIG. So I'm delighted to welcome in our members and cyber community to this webinar. This, is, this will be the first one of a series of activities that will take place every two weeks and will, that will end in, in October. All this to commemorate the Cybersecurity Month and the global launch of this group. So stay tuned. And also, I would like to thank Mr. Kellerman, our keynote speaker, and, and, our, and, and Mr. Brennan, our moderator, for making a space within their busy agendas to share knowledge with our community. Having said that, I will let uh, Mr. Brennan to start off this webinar. So on behalf of our board, of our board uh, members, thank you so much and enjoy the webinar. Just, just, just to let you know, this is, this, the webinar is, is being recorded. So Mr. Brennan, uh, uh, Feel free to, to start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sounds good, Oscar. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Brennan. So depending on where you are in the world, uh, good morning, good evening. Um, my background is uh, here to help moderate this particular panel for Mr. Kellerman. Uh, if you don't know the OWASP organization, the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, I'm on the board of directors for this 55,000 member organization worldwide that focuses on building secure software, breaking software, and defending our operations. I encourage everyone on the line to take a look at OWASP.org, O-W-A-S-P.org. There's over 250 chapters around the world, including in your backyard. Uh, these are like-minded colleagues that focus on software and software security. So with that, I guess the best way to kick this off here, sir, is a little bit of your background, and then we can get into some questions, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to support. I am a huge advocate of OWASP. I have been for years since I began my career as a penetration tester. And it's an honor to be able to discuss not only the current threat landscape, but the tactics and procedures one can use to effectively mitigate today's cyber threats. I am the CEO of Strategic Cyber Ventures. I'm also a professor of Espionage and Crime at American University and a Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. And Strategic Cyber Ventures is actually a fund dedicated to investing in the next generation cybersecurity controls and architectures specific to disrupting the advanced kill chain. Excellent, excellent. So, sir, perhaps you can help us out with sort of uh, kicking off the conversation around uh, the threatscape and how you see uh, intrusions and intrusion detection in that sort of space changing a little bit from your background and from your, uh, from your knowledge. Well, first of all, cyberspace of today has become much more hostile. Uh, this is not just because of the reality of nation states creating divisions of the militaries dedicated to cyber warfare, but also because of the arms bazaar that exists of a cyber attack capabilities that are being distributed from the dark web in Eastern Europe as well as Latin America. We have to respect the fact that attacks are becoming more punitive. You, we've moved from a landscape and environment wherein home burglary in cyberspace, metaphorically, was the primary problem to, to one of home invasion and subsequent arson. The dangerous attack trends that I'm seeing today, um, specific to cyber, are watering hole attacks. Um, these are attacks that will compromise your legitimate website. Uh, which would employ destructive payloads like ransomware to target those people who trust your brand and your brand presence online. More and more, we're seeing mobile attacks that are leveraging proximity settings, as in turning in the microphone, turning on the camera, specific to location and calendar settings. Uh, this is incredibly relevant as it relates to C-level officials within organizations and government agencies. We're seeing business email compromise used as a second stage of attack, not just for the purposes of transferring funds, but for the purposes of then leveraging the email servers of the righteous benevolent victim against their constituencies with payloads. And we're seeing more and more wipers uh, deployed to, as part of counter-incident response and more and more DDoS attacks to facilitate smoke screens for long-term infestations. 
Um, that's from a vector perspective. Uh, from a strategic and macro global perspective, you're seeing a dramatic increase in the hacking activity of the Russian cyber militia community with Pawnstorm as it's dramatically increased its activity in tandem uh, with the military exercises occurring um, in the Baltics. You're seeing Stone Panda, otherwise known as APT-10, uh, more often than not target large corporations um, out of China um, with island hopping attacks against their supply chain for the purposes of essentially front running their, their moves as it relates to mergers and acquisition strategies. Um, you're seeing more and more disillusioned uh, Europeans and Americans, whether they be uh, fascists, whether they be um, anti-fascists, whether they be uh, anti-regimes, uh, leveraging cyber attack capabilities uh, to, to essentially reflect their disillusionment in society. And then you're seeing more and more uh, worms. I mean, this has definitely been the year of the worm. Um, we're seeing worms leveraging attack payloads that were custom made by the U.S. government for foreign adversaries being leveraged against corporations. And you're seeing a reflection um, of these corporations essentially um, struggling with, with their current incident response and strategic technologies as they, as they attempt to defend against uh, these types of attacks. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's certainly a lot of information for people to digest, and I would agree with you from my perspective. I, I see kind of the same uh, same issues that are facing the uh, the growing concerns. Do you have any um, Do you have any background as it pertains to uh, the what threat actor groups are you most concerned with? Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, one or two of them during your your introduction. I'm wondering if there's any any more focused information around those areas you want to dive into. Yeah, I think uh, incredible research has been done by both Trend Micro and CrowdStrike per the Russian threat, specifically the Russian-speaking cyber threat, uh, the, the, w the way in which cyber criminals are now banding together as cyber militia members to, to pay homage uh, to the regime of Vladimir Putin through cyber attack. Um, you can find much more information on Pawnstorm and the vectors employed there on both Trend Micro's website as well as uh, on CrowdStrike's website as it relates to the group Fancy Bear. Vis-a-vis um, -vis Stone Panda and APT-10, uh, there's been great research done in this area by both Symantec uh, and Sophos, as well as uh, Trend Micro. Uh, what's interesting about Stone Panda and APT-10 is, is more and more economic espionage is being conducted by this group. Um, they have shifted from leveraging spearfishes to leveraging watering hole attacks, but then conducting island hopping through the trusted supply chain. And then the one group that is becoming much more effective, both in their tactical acumen and their strategic acumen, is the Lazarus Group associated with North Korea. Uh, we've seen a dramatic metamorphosis of both their capabilities and coordination, not just with their attacks against the financial sector in order to, I guess, counteract the economic sanctions, but more and more of their overt attacks against major uh, defense contractors and U.S. government agencies. Um, in the Middle East, you know, you're seeing uh, a slower evolution of capability by the Syrian Electronic Army. Um, you're seeing more and more groups uh, leveraging attacks, uh, whether it be against uh, Sunni against Shiite or Shiite against Sunni or East against West. Um, but what we need to appreciate is more and more of these groups are leveraging uh, kill chain style attacks where there are multiple stages of attacks. More and more of these groups are leveraging multiple command and controls and putting a secondary command and control on sleep cycle. And more and more of these groups are becoming punitive with their attacks to leverage destructive payloads as part of counter incident response. And so I'm very concerned now that we've entered a new era of cyber attack where no longer is it just about stealing your secrets, but it's about uh, changing your mind and, and affecting your reality through cyber attack. Wow, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely interesting. Um, so from, from my perspective recently, I did some critical infrastructure work and, and the thing that I find interesting about the topic, about the suppression component, is certainly in the space of even in our telco spaces, right? So with many organizations and individuals that constantly complain about getting ghost calls or robot calls to their telephone, um, you know, that's an area of focus as well from an availability, a denial of service to organizations, especially emergency management. So emergency management, you know, deals with uh, responding to incidents from people that need everything from an ambulance to, you know, human life issues. And certainly when those call systems are flooded, uh, you're utilizing the, you know, uh, you, those call systems are flooded. This could definitely go ahead and cause distraction uh, and flooding of the uh, call system for uh, emergency responders. 
so this continued space continues to grow. So what exactly is intrusion suppression, sort of the title of, the, of our discussion here? H how, do you, how do you address that, and, and, and what does that mean to you? Well, thank you for asking. What's important to recognize about intrusion suppression is that for a long time now, our cybersecurity architectures have been based on standards, standards which were created by a consensus by standard makers, whether they be U.S. government officials, international officials, ISO et al., um, specific to a threat that manifested six to seven years ago. And as we both know, and as the audience well recognizes, the kill chain of cyber has evolved dramatically beyond reconnaissance and delivery and exploitation and command and control to uh, stages of lateral movement and stages of maintenance within infrastructure to, to maintain persistence. What we used to call an APT-like threat, which was a monopoly of U.S. government, Chinese government, and Russian governments, uh, has now been commoditized and is being widely utilized by the adversary. So that being said, we need to basically invert cybersecurity architectures. Our cybersecurity architectures of the future must resemble a supermax prison much more so than they resemble the castle of today. It's also all about a resource-constrained environment for the adversary. Or in the U.S., the greatest supermax prison developed is the ADX facility in Florence, Colorado. It was developed by psychologists to create a control cell unit environment around prisoners so that they did not have any situational awareness. When they looked out their little window every day, they never saw the horizon. When they moved between cell blocks, they did throw in tunnels with new guards every day. And when they spent their one hour outside based on the Geneva Conventions, they stared solely at the desert blue sky. It's that type of experience that we have to give to the hackers who bypass our perimeter defenses. So intrusion suppression by definition is that control cell unit environment. It is by definition an environment where you can detect deceive, divert, contain, and hunt an adversary unbeknownst to the adversary within your infrastructure. The utility of it is simple. I think the true ROI for cybersecurity investment beyond the obvious brand protection is a decrease in dwell time. Can you show your board of directors that you have decreased the amount of time that the intrusion of today spent in your network without you reacting to it versus last year? Wow, yeah, that's uh, definitely a great explanation. I appreciate that. Um, so when we start talking about the justification for the return on investment in cybersecurity uh, or increasing the resources, obviously it's a resource constraint space we live in, right? The, the workplace doesn't have enough people. There's probably too many. Everyone's trying to justify their existence from my, you know, what business are we really in? Are we in the business of cyber? Are we in the business of financial services or healthcare or, uh, or, or another industry? Um, so how would you justify that um, in, 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 this, in this context? Well, given that 85 to 90 percent of a corporate, corporation's assets are digitized, essentially, or are not tangible, per se, and that are holistically being sustained by an IT environment, we need to appreciate that, you know, the World Bank and IMF noted that we are saving 98 cents on the dollar by moving away from brick and mortar to IT everything. Uh, and of that savings, we are reinvesting less than 5% of that savings into sustaining or securing that environment. But more importantly, we're spending a tremendous amount of money, over 12% of corporate budgets on marketing, much of which is allocated towards digital marketing campaigns, email campaigns, banner ad campaigns, mobile app development, website development, and as you well know, uh, that is just increasing the attack surface of an organization. We need to get to a point where this is no longer an IT problem. And it's not just moving and transitioning this to a risk problem where you have to conduct a risk calculus. This has everything to do with brand and brand protection. And the sustainability of your entity and your commercial activity in the future will be based upon the fact that consumers and partners have trust and confidence in the security and privacy of your environment. So do, do you think that that, that that statement, of course, is you, know, you can't go into business without all of these controls and systems in place, does that drive the amount of security services how an organization to actually enter into a marketplace and actually compete um, with all these tools and people? I mean, is it really a, a silver platter for a managed services provider, or is it more of simple steps and processes that organizations can use uh, best practices, procedures, et cetera, to do business securely in a, in a secure manner that can be 
verified by potentially a third party. What's your opinion on that? Oh, well, that's a great question. I think, frankly, it's, it's the latter. Um, if you don't have the, the, the right staff or the right maturity of your staff and you haven't adopted a forward-leaning uh, cybersecurity strategy, then I would use a managed service or managed security provider uh, to do so for you. That being said, I think there's some quick wins any organization can take uh, in the near term to deal with today's threat. I think fundamentally, um, you know, frankly, the OWASP, uh, testing for OWASP vulnerabilities and having remediation timetables is of paramount importance in today's environment, um, followed by, you know, embracing the 20 critical controls that are espoused by the SANS organization as well as uh, U.S. government agencies. 20 critical controls were developed by pen testers and by the NSA and by SANS instructors on the most commonly used exploitable gaps within um, cybersecurity or cyber architectures. I'm a huge fan of deploying capabilities like deception grids and deception technologies within your infrastructure around critical databases, critical subnets, and critical users. So you get zero false positives as to an intrusion that has occurred. I'm a huge fan of employing user entity behavior analytics to ascertain um, and get great situational awareness to the unknown unknowns that are occurring in your environment and cross-correlate those to your endpoint protection strategies and incident response strategies. I think there's a lot of room for improvement in existing control deployments, like your IPS should be integrated with your breach detection system. They should not be standalone. They should not be manned separately. I think that we should do regular red teaming and penetration testing from the perspective of the compromised host, so inside out attack path mapping. And this is very useful as part of incident response. And last but not least, we have to remember authentication. Yes, you need to move to two-factor or three-factor authentication, but we need to remember that sometimes a user, a device, a secondary network, a subnet has been compromised. So before we just re-image the machines and reissue private keys and new forms of authentications to the users, we have to dynamically verify who they are and then force them to prove, know thy customer, uh, virtual in proofing that they are who they are before they get access. And there's technologies out there called, uh, that leverage this functionality, it's called adaptive authentication. And that's of paramount importance because of the nature in which privileged credentials and accounts are compromised by adversaries uh, within the first two or three stages of an attack. That's fantastic, I appreciate the insight. Um, do you feel that there's particular sectors of organizations or sectors or, or corporations in general that are more cyber secure than others? Would, would you start with a particular market segment? If there's people on the call here that represent them, which ones do you particularly call out as uh, both low hanging fruit to the adversary as well as potentially uh, infrastructures that have potentially been hardened based on their investment and, and their, uh, their growth? The financial sector is by far the most secure, but that being said, the greatest hackers in the world are targeting the financial sector because money is digital. And so even though they have the most significant cybersecurity investments and resources, they're being targeted by the best of the best. The greatest weakness of the financial sector cybersecurity posture is specific to the technical service providers um, who are typically not as secure as the entities they provide services to and they are typically being targeted by advanced adversaries to island hop into those secure networks through those trusted connections. The second most secure sector is probably the defense industrial base, regardless of where you are in the world, for obvious reasons. But again, they're being targeted by nation state adversaries, so they have a similar problem. Greater security, but a greater adversary. Uh, beyond that, I really think it's, it's the most significant corporate personalities within your nation, wherever you live. Uh, that are doing business internationally, especially with European businesses, as they're held to account for higher standards of care as it relates to securing data. My one biggest challenge that I'm seeing is some organizations, uh, based on various regulations and guidances, seem to over-rely on encryption um, as a panacea for security and fail to understand that when a hacker compromises your infrastructure, when they escalate privileges, they also steal the keys to give access to unlock set encryption. And so we need to fundamentally remember that in the end of days, it's all about protecting the user, the user experience, but more importantly, it's about inherently limiting the capacity of adversaries to island hop through your infrastructure. Even if it's coming, we need to not just think of that as a binary equation. You shouldn't just be focused on the security of your supply chain and whether or not you can be hacked by them, but the reverse as well. 
should you ever be compromised by an advanced adversary, you must assume that they're going to leverage your brand and your network to use the supply chain that you are a part of through your business dealings to target your biggest clients and your biggest partners. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that um, one, one of the many fears that's been discussed in, in, in smaller circles, perhaps, is that, you know, when we have these large disruptions of organized crime or large disruptions of uh, money making schemes, um, one thing we really haven't seen that much of yet, there are a few cases that tie it back, but it's human life. The concept of you know having investigators and people and incident responders that are actually doing the work uh, of the white hat side of helping stop the crime or shut down a uh, illegal network or stop a, a pedophilia ring or stop a, a smuggling operation whatever it may be uh, we really haven't seen too many um, responses from the narcos or from the different organizations that are uh, directly impacted um, and of course the physical side to the electronic side and people die over it, I think it changes the game quite quickly. Uh, we've seen a lot of cyber conversation. We haven't really seen a lot of, um, we haven't seen a lot of people that are actually doing the work be directly affected uh, and being uh, targeted as a result of doing the work for the, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the white hat side. I wonder if you have any comments, sir, on the, uh, on the conversation around the physical or the kinetic discussion as it pertains to the cyber person that you know, sit behind a keyboard most of the day uh, and perhaps things they should be aware of in their personal lives when they touch systems that are tied to organized crime and individuals that typically are a little more unforgiving than others. Yeah, no, that's very real. I mean, payback is real in the underground and the nature in which nature in which they defend themselves, the nature in which the operational security and counterintelligence and thus the punitive nature of the dark web has become much more uh, relevant. I would also suggest that you're seeing more and more infrastructures who are being targeted by uh, integrity attacks, integrity attacks that could um, undermine the validity and integrity of sensitive data that has uh, essentially control over ICS systems or things that can relevant, relevantly create a physical experience in the real world. I think the greatest example of that outside of the energy sector is what you're seeing in the transportation sector with more and more outages, glitches, defaults, uh, train systems around the world, uh, et cetera, as well as um, certain small time aviation aspects of, of control where you see an entire airline essentially go down for six to eight hours because some new software was added, right? But who actually added the software? Is that just spin and crisis communications of the entity? What we need to appreciate here is simple. In order for us to be effective, we have to appreciate that because mobile attacks are here to stay, that more and more adversaries are leveraging the footprint they have on your mobile device to become, to manifest themselves within your physical environs. And more and more often than not, you're seeing compromised mobile devices, especially Android devices for that matter, um, being utilized in this capacity to essentially assist themselves in bugging your environment because you're carrying the bug. My number one recommendation here, besides obviously using mobile security, is when you're in a sensitive setting, and if you insist on bringing in your device because it has information stored on it that you need for said meeting, at a minimum, turn it on airplane mode. At a minimum, turn it on airplane mode. Excellent, excellent. So just as a reminder for the folks that are in their car driving or at their keyboards typing, uh, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. I'll be happy to uh, check them out and, uh, and read them off. Uh, our first one comes from Leela. Uh, she was asking which topic in cybersecurity can be taken for research purposes, any suggestions? So perhaps Tom, uh, any, any particular areas that you think more research is needed, a good focus for people to say, hey, here's, a, here's an area that we could use some more help in, uh, any suggestions? Well, from a policy and strategic perspective, I think it's the construct of active defense. Uh, what does the full spectrum of active defense look like? When does it cross the line? And, and when can it be utilized to protect your data? Um, from a technological perspective, a tremendous amount of research should be done um, into the, the inevitability of systemic attacks against cloud environments and the need for greater hypervisor security. Uh, and what the weaknesses are there so that they can be addressed ahead of time. 
So from a funding perspective, um, this is obviously always an interesting spot. Um, where do you think a lot of that funding comes from? Because research is people's time and energy. So how do organizations or individuals that are looking to potentially get involved in these, uh, these research topics, how do you suggest they get funded for their time to do those sort of activities? Or do you think it's all done by the volunteers? Uh, you know, some corporations will, play, will pay for advanced research. If you want to get a job doing threat research or vulnerability research, I highly recommend you look at the 2,000 cybersecurity companies that are out there, all of which are hiring, all of which are in need of significant talent. Um, so long as you're flexible enough um, with your work and travel um, plans, I, I think that you can get yourself gainfully employed to conduct the type of research that you choose to. There's obviously the academic uh, community that is need for research specific to vulnerabilities, but also I think the academic community has a greater desire to bridge uh, the technical vulnerabilities to uh, real world policy and or governance issues that will be challenges of both corporations and or governments. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. And maybe it's appropriate to throw out you know, two additional plugs. The, the OWASP Foundation uh, does have uh, research grants available for individuals that want to participate in new projects. Um, so that's something to take a look at uh, as, a, as an opportunity to help build better software, uh, break software more efficiently, perhaps, uh, or even defend against uh, software attacks. So something to take a look at. Uh, the Center for Internet Security, the CIS group that produced the, uh, the, the top 20 that SAMS has used, uh, Center for Internet Security is also one of those organizations to consider looking at. Um, and there's also another organization known as Crest. Uh, Crest is also in the space to help professionalize and, and uh, raise the bar, if you will, uh, on these sort of uh, assessments and security criteria. So there's lots of organizations that uh, are out there for the benefit of the community. Uh, they are usually funded or uh, closely aligned to organizations, and as Tom said, mostly all of them are hiring. Um, so if you find yourself looking for uh, opportunity, uh, start you know start where you can. Uh, and most of the organizations that support these uh, these trade organizations. Uh, are usually very healthy in this space. Another question coming in here, a uh, question I'll try to interpret it here. Um, every now and then, we are getting to know the continuous advancement uh, and ever increasing intensity on the dark net. With all the IoT and all, the I, and all of the artificial intelligence going explosive in all different directions, how suppressive our defensive systems are? Are we making ourselves more vulnerable? <laughs> uh, I don't know where to start, where to end on that one. Yeah. We're becoming more vulnerable because of the consolidation of data and the amount of outsourcing that we leverage within our own information supply chain. We're becoming more vulnerable as we embrace the millennial culture to uh, create greater and greater brand awareness. Um, we are opening up a greater attack surface. Um, if you don't invest in cybersecurity technologies that are integrated into one another through APIs, or that are platform specific, uh, you are making yourself more vulnerable because you're dealing with a tremendous volume of data and you're ineffectual in, in integrating your response uh, to phenomenon. Um, you should expect to be hit and prepare to survive, but survival doesn't just mean triaging and cleaning and notification. Survival actually means how do you then uh, turn the tables on the adversary and ensure you push them out of your entire supply chain. Excellent, excellent. Any other questions, please feel to drop them into chat. Um, but definitely it's uh, an interesting discussion here. I wonder if you can highlight any uh, particular uh, trophies uh, or showcase any success stories uh, of, of your own or of industry in this particular space. This is a question coming in. Well, no, most of what I could discuss, I can't discuss openly, frankly. I will say that shining a deep light into the dark web of Eastern Europe uh, through the research of the Pawnstorm campaign, which, which I was a part of when I was at Trend Micro as CSO there, uh, effectively allowed a lot of the defenders to learn from the capabilities of the adversary and begin to retrofit defensive countermeasures that could disrupt that kill chain. Um, had we not done that, had we, the collective cybersecurity community of folks like Trend Micro and CrowdStrike et al., um, you would be dealing with more and more significant long-term infestations of critical infrastructures and corporations in the Western world that, frankly, uh, would be unresolvable long-term. 
Sure, sure. And and from the campaign's perspective, right? Uh, there, there's lots of campaigns that are tracked, whether it be Shamoon or uh, AT Mitch or Dive Attack or Cloud, et cetera, et cetera. There's you know there's many of them out there. Um, how do you see a operation or a campaign um, actually being detected and then being tracked and then being uh, reported on? Like from your perspective, a lot of people always ask the question of, well, how do these things get detected and what the process is behind them? Any any comments on that? I think um, more and more you're seeing great information being provided, not just by the vendor community, by organizations like uh, the NKIC, um, the US CERT, the financial uh, services, ISAC, um, even the IT ISAC. Um, this is all about cooperation and collaboration. Uh, we're never going to civilize cyberspace if we don't get on top of it. Um, like I said before, the, the most significant threat actors of today um, I, I would name them as the Pawn Storm actors, uh, the Stone Panda slash APT-10 actors, a Lazarus group, and the Syrian Electronic Army um, of, of most significance. Even if you feel like you wouldn't be targeted by one of these entities, you need to pay attention to who your customers and partners are, because if they are targeted by these entities, it's a matter of time before you will feel uh, the impact. Yeah, great, great, great point there. Great point of looking at the downstream liability of suppliers and third parties that have access to your networks. Um, certainly, a, I think an overlooked area of focus when your know, organization uh, has a high risk, they know it, uh, but then they lose sight of some of their partners and some of the people that have access, legitimate access to their to their business systems. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit uh, on some of the uh, common threads in the news relative to ransomware. Uh, and again, with your background, perhaps you can shed some light for the attendees. Um, you know, we hear too often um, that, you know, if you would have patched the system, you wouldn't have had the problem. If you would have uh, gone ahead and had minimum controls in, in, in place, you wouldn't have had the issue. Um, where do you see the uh, legislation going in this space, in particular around organizations that, you know, have shut down or have had uh, problems, especially publicly traded ones? Uh, and, you know, we have some recent situations, right? We have uh, pharmaceutical companies that have been shut down and unable now to provide vaccines to help save human life. Um, how do you see that uh, impact in their stock or how do you see that impacting regulatory issues that are now tied to human life? So just your opinion on, on you know, what seems simple ransomware, but of course the, uh, the impact to the, to the organization at, or impact at a, at a much bigger scale. So there are some very easy solutions for ransomware, sorry to say so, but um, using deception technology or deception grids can basically stop ransomware and tracks as the ransomware will effectively infect the decoy system and then spin around in circles there. Um, in terms of legislation, I don't think Congress has the appetite, uh, especially a Republican Congress, to impose new regulations uh, or legislation in the, era of cyber, in, in, in the area of cybersecurity or cyberspace. Um, the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is not an advocate of that, and neither is the major technology lobby. The, the regulation and legislation we need to pay attention to is the GDPR regulation coming out of the European Union. Um, by May 18th of next year, every organization that does business with Europeans must have a data protection officer at the C-level who reports not to the CEO, but to the board. Uh, this individual is responsible for uh, not only creating, but enforcing a protection strategy that goes beyond compliance and encryption uh, for all the customers uh, that are European. And should you not be compliant or deemed to be compliant with this, you could lose and be fined up to 4% of your annual revenues. So if you're gonna pay attention to one thing that is coming down the pike, which has already been codified in the law, it's the GDPR, and you have until May, of, May 18th of next year to do so. Now remember this, for the love of God, don't choose your privacy attorney or your compliance attorney to become the GPO, okay? This is the inevitable, perfect career path for the CISO uh, to move into. And inevitably, the deputy of the CISO should become the CISO. Um, but frankly, from a corporate governance perspective, since you're being given this opportunity to empower the security mission, to make it a protection mission versus a security mission, I, I advocate that you take your CISO, educate them on GDPR, elevate them to this position, and have them choose their deputy to become their day-to-day -day tactical manager. Well, that's an interesting insight. GDPR certainly has been a hot topic of recent 
Uh, for perhaps the folks on the, on the line that aren't super familiar with it, can you summarize it for us? Yes, essentially the data protection uh, initiative regulation from the Europeans here uh, stresses that if you handle European data, you, you touch European data, you do business with European companies, uh, who do touch or handle European data, uh, that you need to uh, adhere to a higher level of protection of that information. It, it basically melds finally uh, and creates the nexus between privacy and security uh, efforts of an organization. It also stresses the import of going beyond compliance or just encrypting data in so much that that's insufficient. And it insulates uh, the C-level personality, the DPO, from termination by a CEO so that they can be more proactive with their initiatives. And then, frankly, it's got a huge stick. Um, it's very punitive if you are deemed to be in noncompliance and that they can literally fine you up to 4% of your revenue. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for that overview. Um, changing gears a second, and I think this has been a great and informative call. Um, we, we continue to hear things in the news that may impact, again, human life. Uh, we recently had an announcement from the cyber recall around um, Abbott Labs for the pacemakers. Uh, and of course, you know, we start looking at implantable devices and it sort of changes the game a little bit, right? Having the ability to have an intrusion suppression device around systems that are beaconing from within our bodies becomes a whole game changer. Just wondering if you have any opinions or any thoughts on uh, that if you were perhaps one of these people that had to have a medical device that was internet connected or could be, could be updated remotely via Bluetooth, how would you uh, how would you protect against that? What do you think some of the concerns should be in the medical realm? It's terrifying. It's terrifying the the state of medical device security. Uh, you know, there's a lot of limitations for hospitals and doctors in terms of how frequently they can update these devices, as all devices must be certified. These would be the implantable devices within uh, human beings. You know, it's, it's absolutely something out of a sci-fi movie that, that you could literally conduct a, a targeted attack that could render someone lifeless uh, through a Bluetooth attack on, on a pacemaker in today's world. Um, the greater care and greater attention must be paid to the development life cycle of these devices and a more seamless way of updating these devices must be developed into the ecosystem. Uh, I think finally HHS and the FDA are becoming more proactive in this regard. As we saw yesterday, I'm hoping that they go further with it um, so far as to advocate some things um, that you and I know are best practice, OWASP being one of them. Excellent, thank you. So again, it seems like it goes bounce back and forth between the legislation and, of course, trying to uh, you know put a hammer down on in, uh, software developers. Um, and there's even been conversation around individuals that touch high-risk systems having uh, almost a license to code. Uh, I was wondering what your opinion is on the the big space of of cyber certification and accreditation of uh, individuals and or companies. It's hodgepodge. Um, it's hodgepodge. I don't. I don't even. You know, there's there's a couple certification authorities out there of relevance. Um, whether it's SANS or ICS, um, you know, Squared or something else. But you know, frankly, um, I, it's hodgepodge. I, it really just depends on the background of the individual. I would say this for the record, um, and forgive those of you who don't agree with it. Um, you know, a network cybersecurity specialist. Uh, it's not the same thing as an application security specialist. An incident responder uh, who's certified is not the same thing as a certified ethical hacker. Um, you need to create multidisciplinary teams around um, various activities. You need to integrate the technology platforms so that it's not just dependent upon the skill set of, of the operator or the security professional. I think one of the greatest illustrations of this are the hunt teams. Uh, these hunt teams are being created within major financial institutions and government agencies. These hunt teams typically combine members of the threat intelligence team, the incident response team, and the red team. Uh, I think that's a quintessential example of how you can bring to bear various skill sets and certifications to go after a similar mission of hunting an already compromised system within your infrastructure. Well, I guess that puts, uh, puts a cherry on top. I think it's uh, easy to say, and most of us would probably agree, um, that you know, the, the cavalry is not coming. I think Josh Corman and some of the folks involved in that movement, known as the I Am the Cavalry movement, are right. 
Uh, you know, we are now the adults in the room. We, we, many of us have been you know, acting in this space for many, many years, myself about now whew, almost two decades. Uh, and it really comes down to us. Nobody's going to solve the problem. No one's going to write a magical policy. No one's going to push a uh, code out the door that's going to solve the issue. Uh, it really comes down to working better together uh, as a group. And that also comes down with having, you know, circles of trust, people that you've actually worked with, folks that you can actually verify, uh, and you can hopefully work within the ethics boundary to focus on. Money does strange things to people, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we would hope that we're here to try to uh, help commerce, uh, help economic su success, and certainly help others around the world. Um, I think that's, a, at least that's the, the world I want to be a part of. Um, in closing, uh, I wonder if you have any additional comments for the, uh, for the group. Um, that you might want to share or a question you want to pose to them so that they can poke or pro provide some questions back to us uh, in the chat if they would like for them to be asked. No, I just, you know, cyberspace is not a civil environment. It, it, we are on our own and, and we need to truly reevaluate how we conduct business and with whom we conduct business in order to civilize our own experience in that environment. It's sad to say, but I think more and more often we're moving towards a gated, a gated community type environment in the cloud. Um, and comparative advantage of organizations will be dictated on the fact that they invest more heavily in cybersecurity. Um, I do think this is the year that cybersecurity becomes directly connected to the brand, um, directly a function of brand protection. Now, more and more 10K filings are gonna be occurring uh, with lower uh, revenues due to cyber attacks, you know, in the after the third quarter, and frankly, we just need to continue to to share information and to become as proactive as possible. Uh, one resource I'd like to give to the group is I read a column at, on CSO Online or CSO Magazine. It's called Intrusion Suppression. Um, it's objective, it's thoughtful, but uh, hopefully, it can add some value to your efforts. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it looks like we probably have a worldwide audience here on the uh, participants list and people listening to the recording. Um, I, I know uh, I participate a lot in events in New York City, which is where I'm based out of, and also things like Black Hat and DEF CON. I'm wondering if there's any conferences around the world that you'd like to call out as a suggestion for people to attend and participate, because I think uh, many of us would, would agree a lot of the value sometimes is in the hallways, meeting with people and talking you know, as a human. Uh, but I wonder what content conferences you, you've actually enjoyed and would recommend publicly. You know, one of the newer ones that's occurred that, that began last year in Dublin, and it occurs in Dublin, and it occurs uh, in, in the U.S., in New York, uh, every six months, and that is uh, Zero Day Con. I think it's very useful. And then from a hardcore technical perspective, uh, obviously B-Sides. Um, um, but the challenge with the hardcore technical perspective is that it gives you a tactical solution or workaround to a significant vector. Um, I think if you want to become more strategic and you want to build those relationships um, with the CISO community, CIO community, or general counsel, or chief risk officer community, or even DPO community, um, conferences like Zero Day Con will allow you to do just that. I, I would I would agree with that sentiment. I think uh, there's there's a lot of uh, um, conferences, of course, that focus on the on the on the breaking, uh, very few on the on the building, uh, and of course those are usually focused developer conferences. Um, and then lastly, you know, trying to have the defenders be represented. There's very few defender conferences. I did an event with uh, uh, some folks in Austin, Texas last year, and the entire focus of the conference was was defending. Uh, very small attendance because it really wasn't as sexy as the the latest, greatest hack. It was more focused on architectural analysis and threat attack models and threat trees. And it was a very interesting conference because we spent a lot of time looking at sort of the way to do it right from, you know, different experiences in the room. Uh, but yeah, so I, I would agree with that. Um, another question's come in here on, on the chat to me, uh, talks about hacking tools. Uh, and this person feels that there's uh, more hacking in the industry due to the fact that there's so many openly available tools that are being produced uh, and that are out there for people to use and push buttons on, causing chaos and mayhem. And perhaps they should be held accountable for releasing tools in the open source community. Wondering what your thoughts are on that, and I certainly have a few thoughts myself. They're right. <laughs> 
I don't have an opinion on the tools along. If the tools are free, the tools are free. Um, you know, typically, uh, they're free for a reason. They're free for gray hat community to conduct research. If they're misused, they're misused. Um, one tool or another isn't going to make or break your cybersecurity posture unless you don't have a layered or defense in depth approach. Um, vis a vis those who charge for the tools, uh, those who charge individuals for use of tools, I do take issue with those. I'm not referring to the penetration testing or vulnerability scanning tools that are sold to accredited researchers or sold to corporations, but to those who do not even vet their customers who just sell haphazardly something that can exploit or tendril uh, against uh, a target, um, I do take issue with. What I recommend to be done there, um, I haven't decided. I honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I, I understand the complexity of the issue at hand. Excellent, excellent. I, I, I share some of the same sentiment. Um, my own opinion here uh, is certainly I, I have produced uh, open source tools that can be used for both sides. Uh, I, I've had a, a tool that caught me a lot of static or chatter when it was released uh, as a performance testing tool, uh, originally used and built by me for the purposes of determining how many consecutive users could do transactional trading online through a web application so that they could do stock trading. However, if you were to change your hat and you were to point it at a website that you didn't know and you pressed a button, you'd bring it to its knees. Um, so the conversation there was this denial of service tool uh, was really a performance tool, but depends on who's pushing the button. Um, so I, I agree with your sentiment there that if you know, tools are being used or sold, uh, perhaps the people that buy them have to be, I don't know, vetted, which creates a, a very interesting, you know, can of worms. Uh, here in the United States, obviously, you usually can't buy a, a weapon, a gun, uh, of course, without uh, a license. Uh, and that opens up a, a very big discussion, right? It's, it's guns don't pe kill people, right? People do. Uh, and we really can't control the ethics or the principles of the individual. So it's a very interesting conversation. We start m making technology uh, aligned to the, the what I call the laws that don't work very well in the cyber cyber realm. There's many cases uh, out there that people would recognize that are tied to, uh, let's say, a, um, a physical crime. Uh, and the sentence for a physical crime could be several, let's say, years in a federal penitentiary. Where that a, a white collar crime could get you a slap on the wrist and they, uh, uh, hey, you shouldn't do that anymore, but could could wreak havoc. And it also flips the other way around. Uh, a physical crime could, could give a very small amount of uh, sentence, where that a cyber crime, you know, violation of the CFAA laws could put somebody behind uh, for many, many years. So there's a lot to do in this. Uh, calling out another organization, Electronic Frontier Foundation, known as the EFF or EFF.org. Um, they also do a lot of work in this space on both sides of the fence. So I would, again, encourage people to take a look at what uh, opportunities are there to volunteer uh, or to spend some time uh, working on the common common goal. Um, and I guess the common goal is to be defined by the individual. So with that, uh, Oscar, we're coming to the end of our, our timeline here. I want to hand it back to you, sir, for any final comments or any additional items you want to promote for events that are coming up, sir. Oscar, you there. Let's see if I have Oscar on mute. Okay, I do not, Oscar, so I apologize for that. Uh, any closing comments, closing words before we wrap up the session? Thank you very much for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, anything I can do to help, um, send me a line on Twitter, uh, T.A. Kellerman, and I hope you have a great weekend. Sounds good, you too, sir. Thanks for joining us. I believe this session will be recorded. Uh, unfortunately, I do not know where the link will be, uh, but if you stay in touch with Oscar, who got you invited to this event, I'm sure he can pass that recording along to you. So again, thanks for joining the uh, Internet Society uh, uh, conversation, and look forward to seeing you folks in cyberspace. Thank you.